Last week, I think it was, maybe the week before, Apple had one of their usual press conferences and they announced their latest, possibly last version of the M1 chip, which was the M1 Ultra. And one of the things that they said as they launched it was that they designed it using two M1 Max chips basically stuck together using something called UltraFusion to join them together. Now, UltraFusion is just a marketing buzzword. Um, literally, all they've got is a high-speed interconnect between the two silicon dies to transfer data between them. But one of the things that they said, which was interesting, is that the reason they'd done this was so that you didn't have to write the software in a different way. And I thought it was interesting just to pick up on that and to explain why, if they hadn't made that interconnect fast enough, you would have to write the software in a different way. Because if you think about it, all they seem to be doing is adding more cores to the CPU, making it a 20 core CPU instead of a 10 core CPU. And you think, well, if it's a multiprocessor system, and if you've watched the videos we've done previously on multiprocessor systems, you're gonna to have to write the software to split the tasks up over the multiple cores to run. So why are you not going to have to write things differently with this architecture of chip? So I thought we'd have a look at that today. So to understand what Apple's done, we need to go back to basics and think about how a computer actually works. And we'll go with the von Neumann model. I know technically most modern CPUs are modified Harvard architecture, but the von Neumann model is good for what we want to look at. We have at the center of our system, the CPU, whatever we want, and that is then connected to some memory. And I'm just gonna write RAM here so it fits into the box. Of course, some of it would be ROM and other things. And then the other thing that we have in there is we have the IO and things. And that's basically the model we use for a computer. We've got the CPU talking to the RAM where the instructions and data are stored and it can talk to the IO to talk to the rest of the world. So that's things like your disk controllers, whether it's solid state hard disk, your graphics card, your network card. Now what happens when we have a multiprocessor system. The general way that we build multiprocessor systems, certainly the ones that we use in laptops or using desktop computers, is using what's called a shared memory model. So just as before with the von Neumann architecture, we're gonna have a single block of RAM, and that's gonna be connected, not to one CPU now, but we'll give it two CPUs. So we've got two CPUs that it's connected to. So it's connected to a shared bus between them, and then each of those CPUs are connected to it. Now, effectively, that's how you build a multiprocessor system. There's a bit more involved. For example, you need some sort of logic here for bus arbitration. So we'll call that the ball, the bus arbitration logic. So you need something to sort of control, well, which CPU can talk to the RAM at any one point? Now, one thing I need to say here is that I've drawn this as the CPU talking directly to the RAM. If you think about it, if you watch the video I did many years ago on CPU caches, you need to have a cache here because otherwise only one CPU can ever talk to RAM at the same time. If there's no cache, this CPU tries to talk to RAM, this one can't. If that's this CPU tries to talk to RAM, that one can't at the same time. It would effectively result in serializing the operation so you wouldn't get any speed up. You need a cache in there. And that sort of leads us to the first part of the problem. Only one CPU can access the RAM at any one point. Now, if we've got a cache in our system, and I'm gonna draw that as a red line, which sits between the CPU and between the RAM, that's not a problem because as the CPU accesses data, it stores a local copy in its cache. So when it needs to try and fetch that data or those instructions again, it can fetch them from the cache and not access the RAM. So that's absolutely fine. Most of the time, we want to get it so that the CPUs are satisfying their data and instruction fetches from the cache, and then only occasionally they go to the RAM, so that actually whenever one of the CPU goes to the RAM, needs to go to the main memory to fetch a value, then effectively it's unlikely to be being used by the other one. Occasionally you'll get the situation where they both try and access a value in main memory at the same time, at which point that's why you have the bus arbitration logic to say, this CPU is going to fetch the value, then that CPU is going to fetch the value. So we can build a shared memory multiprocessor system like that. I'm going to say relatively straightforwardly, there's a lot involved, but that's the basic idea of what's going on. And we can extend that to have more CPUs. So we can just add another CPU in 
up here so we could have a three CPU system. Normally you'd probably go up to four and things, but I've run out of paper. It's got its cache as well. And you could extend that for as many CPUs as you like, except there was a slight issue. We said that there are occasions where one CPU might be trying to access the memory at the same time as another CPU. Hopefully we can build the cache system, we can load more data than we need each time we fetch things and so on. We can build an intelligent memory system that can satisfy this so that the probability of that happening is relatively low. But if we think about it, if we add more and more CPUs onto the same shared memory bus, then we're going to end up with more chance of a collision happening of two CPUs trying to access memory at the same time. And the caches on each CPU mitigate that to some effect so that they reduce the probability of two things trying to access at a time. But a bit like the old birthday problem, you know, the sort of question you ask, if you've got a class of school children, what is the probability that two of them share a birthday in there? Turns out it's quite likely once you get above about 20 or so children in the class. The same thing applies here. As you increase more CPUs, the chance that two of them will try and access memory at the same time increases as you add more CPUs. And so this will scale, scale but it'll only scale up to a point. Once you get past a certain number of CPUs, you will find that you're back to the point where actually more, it's more likely than not that two of them will be trying to access memory at the same time. So we can scale this up to a certain number of CPUs. So does that form a limit? Is there a limit on how many CPUs we can have working together in a multiprocessor system? Well, not as such, because there's another way we can design a multiprocessor system. So this is what's known as a uniform memory access system. And the reason it's known as that is that for any location in RAM, any of these CPUs can access it with the same sort of speed. So it doesn't matter whether it's coming from CPU 1 up here or CPU 3 down here, it'll take the same amount of time for them to access the value in that memory location. Um, different memory locations may have different speeds. Your ROM might be slower than the RAM. Uh, you may have things mapped in there which are slower still and so on. But for any particular memory location, each CPU can access it in the same time or within the same nanosecond ballpark. So it makes no difference in reality. As we said, that will scale up to a certain number of CPUs. But if we want to take it to beyond that, then we need to change that system. We need to build a system that no longer has uniform memory access. Rather than from a, a memory location, each CPU being able to access it at the same speed, for each memory location, the speed it takes to access it or how long it takes for it to access the data value there depends on which CPU core is trying to access it. So it might be that for one CPU core, it takes I don't know, let's say 100 nanoseconds, just picking a time off the top of my head. But for another CPU core, it takes 200 nanoseconds. They're just ballpark times, they're not order of magnitude, they just sort of show there's a difference between the two. Okay, let's have a look at how we build a system like that. So what we're talking about is what's referred to as a non-uniform memory access system. So non-uniform memory access system, or NUMA for short. So how does that differ? Well, let's think about it. It starts off in the same way. We have a block of RAM. I'm going to turn the diagram around. RAM like that. And that is connected to our CPUs just as before. I'm missing out the caches and the arbitration logic from this diagram just for simplicity. So this looks relatively similar to what we had before. We've got a, some RAM and some CPU cores sharing access to it. No difference there. With a NUMA system, though, we also have some other RAM that's part of our system connected to a different set of CPU cores over here. Now at this point you've got effectively two computer systems. These CPUs can access this RAM, these CPUs can access this RAM. The difference in the NUMA system is that there is actually a link between the two systems here and you've got a distributed shared memory system. Think of it like a sort of network but it's often done at the CPU level and things even within on some between cores. Now what this means is as far as the program's running there is one block of memory there is. So this is if this was 16 gig and this was 16 gig the programs would see 32 gigabytes. They're not separate blocks of memory. Uh, they, they're seen by the programs as one block of memory. 
But the difference is, is if we've got a program running on this CPU over here, it's got direct access to this block of memory here. So let's say it takes, I don't know, let's say it takes 100 nanoseconds again to access memory. So we've got 100 nanoseconds to access memory. If he wants to access memory in here, it will take 100 nanoseconds to access that memory value. But if the data it's trying to access is over in this memory over here, a CPU over here could access it in 100 nanoseconds. But for this CPU over, he CPU over here, it's got to go over this distributed shared memory connection from this set of RAM and this set of CPUs to this set of RAM and this set of CPU cores over here. And that would take a significant amount of time. I mean, it would take 100 nanoseconds over here to get from here to here. So to get from here to here plus this, let's say this is 200 nanoseconds. I'm just making a number up of here. It's a, it's a longer amount of time. I'm making these numbers off of the top of my head, so don't take them as any sort of things other than so it's longer to go from here over here. So we'd have to go over here across the distributed shared memory link to get the value, and then we could bring the value back. So rather than taking 100 nanoseconds, it would take in the order of 300 nanoseconds. It would take a significantly longer amount of time. So if we build a computer system like this, we have the situation where, depending where an instruction is in memory or where data is in memory, it could either access it very, very quickly on this CPU core, if it can go directly to the RAM that it's directly connected to, or it would end up taking a long time, relatively, to access it because it would have to go over the shared link and fetch it from the other block of RAM over there. It would still appear to be the same memory system, but we've now got the situation where the access to it depends on which CPU is trying to access it. So we have what's called a non-uniform memory access system. Now, originally, non-uniform memory access systems were the sort of domain of high-end cluster systems, sort of SGI-type workstations and things. But these days, you've actually seen it drop down onto sort of workstation-type machines. Some of the AMD Threadripper, some of the higher-end Intel processors are all NUMA-based systems. And what this means is, if you want to run that CPU at the fastest possible speed, you need to write your software to take into account which CPUs have fast access to which bits of RAM so that you can put the data that those CPUs are processing and you can put the instructions that they're running in that block of memory and have the CPU, data, CPU instructions and the data that's being executed on these CPUs in this block of memory over here so they can all access it very, very quickly and you only have a very small amount of data which is needed to synchronize things and keep things working, passing over the shared memory network. Now you can do it and it works great but you have to write your software knowing where things are. And in fact, if you look, you can find papers and presentations from companies like Netflix, where they're really trying to optimize the performance of their servers to serve the videos to you. I'm sure YouTube's doing the same as well, but Netflix have actually written about it, really optimize the speed of serving the videos to you. So they're actually having to take into all this account so that the network card is connected to one CPU, gets that data and doesn't have to go and pass it over the shared memory link to another one, which then passes it over to another one to fetch the data from a hard disk and so on and feed it back to you. And you get everything's passing over the slow link all the time. You really have to take into account where things are. Which brings us back to Apple's marketing buzzword of M1 Ultra Fusion. What have Apple done with M1 Ultra Fusion? Well, effectively, they have built a system like this. They've taken two M1 Max chips and glued them together. So you've got two 10-core M1 Max chips, each accessing their own blocks of memory, or two blocks each, which is why you can get up to 128 gig on there, because you double the amount of CPU cores, you can double the amount of memory that they can access. And what they've built in the middle, the thing they call Ultra Fusion, is just a very, very fast distributed shared memory link between the two. And I think what they've actually done is they've just made it so fast that actually the time it takes to go across from one CPU core to the other to get the value from the RAM and pu push it back into the CPU is so quick, the latency is so low, that effectively it behaves as if it was a uniform memory access system. It's fast enough that when the CPU requests the data, it gets it before it actually needs it, at which point it doesn't slow it down. So it's a nice system because it means as a programmer, we don't have to worry about where the data is in relation to the CPU cores, which one's attached to which core and things to make things run as, run as fast as possible 
we can just write our programs and let the operating system and the design of the hardware sort out the hard problems of executing it as fast as possible. Chunks and do them all at the same time. So one way, for example, to make sandwiches faster is that you butter the bread faster, you put the filling in faster, you put the bread faster, the other person... It's also got an analysis it, of where I went wrong to spread books. Why did he make his name with that and what was it all about?